you to come back. Thank you all for coming today. So I'd just like to give you a quick introduction to uh, this is Paul Moss, and he's going to be providing us with a much of inspired presentation about cyborg astronomy and our fascination with the stars. Goes away for longer and longer periods. And 
that was the inspiration for Martha Leakey and generated the, uh, the concepts of Maui pulling it back and, um, and, and holding it so that as we get through with it, because right now we're pretty close to the longest night, the shortest day that we're going to be into it. Maui pulled the sun back and it hurt him and he needed the seven sisters to look after him and the sun and to bring it back. Our sky is called Rangamuli. So each year we wait for Matariki to rise and um, when I was asked to do this talk I thought perhaps I won't speak as much about Matariki anymore because it's all out there and, and we've talked and talked talk about it. So I'm not really sure what to say about Matariki but the, 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 the basis of it is the Halayaka rise of the Pleiades. In astronomical terms, Halayako Helios is the sun, Tamari Terra, it's just another name for soul or terra. The Egyptians called it Ra, it's the same name. And that inspires us hugely way. The, the Halayako rising of the Pleiades, now the Pleiades is also known as the Seven Sisters, and you can see the Pleiades. If you go to the Northern Hemisphere, it's up there, it's really weird. Here in New Zealand, from Te Papa, it rises over there and it travels and sets over here. But like that's its path, it's a little plain of the ecliptic and it's a little bit south. The thing is that because we travel around the sun and we look at the Pleiades from all different angles for a whole year, it, it appears like the Pleiades. Matariki, the seven sisters, travels behind the sun. And around about June the 2nd this year, it appears in the dawn ahead of the sun that's called the Halayaka rising because it rises in the air. These are some, uh, well, it's one massive picture that I show a few close ups because uh, it's the one that inspires me. It's slightly cosmetic. Uh, it shows that there are two the seven sisters, plus a few more, and the, the looking at that at night time, if you go out there and, and look at Matariki, the Pleiades, you can't see all of those stars, the camera sees them, but the human eye can't. However, before electric light came along, and before industry came along, the stars were much clearer and cleaner for a very long time. Uh, worldwide, there's been incredible interest in the Pleiades for forever, for, well, for 17,000 years, some such. So my proposition is that astronomers and artists were just normal people, that everybody was an astronomer and an artist. And in fact, 70,000 years ago in Lascaux, they, print, they uh, painted Taurus the Bull and I don't know about lions in France, but they definitely painted lions in caves, um, deer, horses, and um, mammoths, but I'm also not sure about that stuff. Now in Lascaux, the, the next slide shows quite clearly seven dark dots that they painted on the wall, and those are the Pleiades. The next shot slide shows how that, I'm not really sure why they that, um, they painted the Pleiades on one side, Taurus the Bull in the centre, and the Hyades on the other side. Now in New Zealand, if you look up and see Orion, you can find the Hyades down to the left and then the Pleiades, Matariki, further and lower like left again. In the Northern Hemisphere, that's completely reversed and iron, higher these, and the Pleiades, up like that. So that's why that's effectively upside down. Now, once we go out of caves, we were pretty fascinated by the sky as a, um, as a 
civilization and we built pyramids and temples and we lined them up. So that if you look at the three pyramids on the uh, Giza Plateau, that, those three there, and you can go to Google Earth, and I just did this a few weeks back and published it out for everybody to see. You can clip a screenshot of Google Earth looking at the pyramids and you can clip a simulation of the um, Orion from a, an astronomy program that's free on ice or something like that. And you can fit them together in two days in Photoshop and adjust the translation and they're an exact fit. So that brings me to the subject that I referred to in Star Wars that a lot of people have been writing about Robert Bovell and um, David Garrett in the USA has been exploring the Hopi Indians building their, their villages in relationship to the, the constellations. Um, yeah, yeah, it's quite exciting because if you look at the Orion and the Milky Way, then you see that the Nile actually becomes the Milky Way. And if you look at the Sun and the Sphinx and the Sun and Leo, uh, they will fit too. Uh, well, at, at, at the same time, or maybe before that, we built stone circles all over the world, thousands upon thousands of stone circles, perhaps millions of stones. Um, it's just there's a huge amount of documentation of this on YouTube now, you can just watch it forever. Here in New Zealand, we built our own version that was styled to Aotearoa. So, Stonehenge Aotearoa, where I took this picture, actually is a working educational tool. And um, so, on the AA, 100 places to visit in New Zealand. Um, Incidentally, that's the, um, the large Magellanic cloud, the large cloud, and the small Magellanic cloud, you can see a white dot next to the Magellanic cloud that happens to be a globular cluster of about one million stars, at about the size of a full moon. So, um, and then we grew up as a society and we had this incredible acceleration of knowledge of astronomy because um, we were taught on our own press, particularly had been studying and then the mathematicians um, put their minds to it and we built planetariums, Harvard Observatory, I talked back in 2004. Um, before the refurbishment, and Harbour has uh, beautiful telescopes, 140 years old, 60 years old, million dollars priceless. This one is, this one took pictures of um, Halley's Comet in 1910, and we ran some functions there, and then the planetarium scored like, get bigger, and, and, and up to huge. Unimaginable, right? I haven't been in those other ones. I'd love to go to it. In 2008, um, uh, 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 an artist and musician composer, Warren Collier, wrote to the Royal Society and asked for somebody to make a movie of the nice guy. Actually, his original idea was to have cameras on the stars and put them on screens while his music played. He made a 24-hour composition based on ancient Gandhara Vega time theory. Um, the idea is that there's eight prahavas in a day, and that's every three hours. And every three hours, you play music that is like a recipe that's specific to that time period that's been created for thousands of years. And, um, he followed the recipe, he automated quite a lot of the process. But uh, I said, okay, I'll do this. Um, took a year. And we created six movies, um, which were the three hour files. It was, it was a, a huge thing, we showed it all over the country. Um, in art galleries, that, that's the actual Shortland Street, 
das große Lehrer ähm, zu nehmen, mit den Files für ihn sagen. Es ist schon ein Seminar, wo möglichst mit dem Lifestyle, der wurde made from stills. Aber ich habe schon gesagt, dass es ein Strong Man, ein Strong Man Ninja, der hat sechs Screens in Galatos in Auckland. Thank you. 
total eclipse of the moon, and if I went up before anybody came, we had 200 people, it was 11 degrees and 20 knots or 30 knots. One time it's awesome. We had 200 people on the south coast in a roaring battle to see that. Once in a lifetime experience, uh, the, the, other, the last one I had a couple of years ago. South Coast. This is what a camera can see. Um, uh, uh, pretty much most uh, SLRs, single lens reflex cameras that you can actually uh, manually open up for 30 seconds, that's about a 30 second shot. Um, on there, you can see.
the TP in order, maybe we'll go and find that in the shop. And City Library, uh, the same weekend, we put the oldest telescope, the oldest New Zealand telescope, into the window of the library for a couple of months. And we put the oldest telescope in New Zealand that's owned by the Bunton Astronomical Society and the Glass Paper. Actually, with the cameras that I took those Aurora photos from, and we played visuals of the sky in the uh, children's uh, library and show the sky on the screens like this. Uh, and then we, we had a bit of fun in the forest. Um, I've had Scotty from ABS, got some wind balloons, um, quite sure how bad it is. And it's not really a shot for astronomy, but we projected planets and stars and, and the moon on the, the sphere of the party. And it was like having this giant moon with us. Um, pretty cool. Stonehenge Arcadero, obviously related to astronomy Arcadero in the name. Um, Richard Ball and Kay Leather run that with the uh, Phoenix Astronomical Society. Um, there's that picture again. And uh, that night I took that photo. Well, it was the night that I took the photos of the, in this book and I'll hand this around at Phoenix. Um, I see it. this is the International Symposium of Electronic Arts and, and this is the catalogue from the exhibition. It was in uh, Turkey, part of the Istanbul Biennale, so that was my dream come true in 84 and soon I did want the Biennale. And I um, got to go there. It was called Tikone Wongahongaro. It was um, subtitled Second Nature, or part of Second Nature. Um, that was the Kiwi exhibition that was part of an overall exhibition for Huntington Tangle that was hosted by Sir Vinci and Mrs. Uh, and there's the museum segment in there. Um, I'm sure that the pages are loosely connected. And this is in Tuxen Square, where everybody I wanted to out, out and saw the right squad and the, the water cannon vehicles and the cars coming and going with dark windows and the robots. And then you know, the 20 year olds in formation with the automatics and all that. And you know, it wasn't scary. I don't know, it didn't seem to be scary. Um, we, we did a couple of uh, um, additional, our own exhibitions in, in Tuxen Square, which we had a right to just do for weeks, and we had some technology on my camera sheet. Uh, you know, what's this? What's this? I just kept the camera rolling, I didn't even think about stopping. And I said, look, we're from New Zealand, we're exhibiting in the gallery over there, and this is our own private little demonstration. Exhibition. So now you can take pictures of the night sky. It's not that hard. You go to the sky, suddenly you can take it with a camera. This is a 20D. It's, it's like nowhere near as good as, as my current camera. And uh, so I do it far. And you can take a photo right now. It, 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 you need um, minus two degrees so that all of the moisture is dropped out of the sky. It's, no moisture, so the sky is very stable and it's freezing, so you've got to have a lot of warm clothes. Um, you need a motorized platform to set the camera on so that it actually follows the stars. And you need a, a camera that's anything better than about a $300 camera. And you can do that. Uh, I know that, just, that's what I did. And for some reason, I got published, which is pretty cool. The artists that were with me were. Way in my um, uh, one more advanced in the art world, Julian Chris, for instance, exhibited a um, thing called uh, Information Comes from the Sun. And so I asked him about that and he told me, and while I was going to talk about it, I thought, oh, we'll just, I won't bore you with that, we'll, I'll put that up on my website. And 
So it's not the idea of dot com or that bit simulation. What he meant that he ties the sun and the energy coming from the sun to the indigenous thinking, uh, both in New Zealand and, and globally. Information comes from the sun. I was very honoured to be part of that. Now, Tamanui Etera, our sun, is also called Sol. And in 2009, I went out to Kasawa before dawn, took the first flight of the International Year of Astronomy, I thought that would be pretty cool, and then broadcast it across the world as we see it first. New Zealand, we see it first. And then there's a sunset um, over a cool strait or a car, um, a sunrise, another sunset from County Bay, I think. Thanks. Thank you. And then a sunset somewhere up on um, Kaki Beach or um, or Waikanae or, or, or something like that. Notice how it's distorted against the weird optical interference and the colour. At about that time there were a lot of bushfires in Australia and honestly up um, in the north end, we saw a sun that was crimson red. It was red and that was red right across. And then something that I want to talk a little bit about, not, not very much, um, this shot here, you see the green uh, on the next shot. In the last half a second to a second, when the sun has it, it's actually just a bit over the horizon that flashes green. It's a blue green flash. I looked it for it for years, it's um, hard to get because you can't really get the sun and you've got to use a lot of filters and stuff and, and you know, move the camera with the sun comes. Um, so I started taking videos and just went through the last few frames. Um, so not really recommend it because of the itself. Um, in Carter there's um, I've got two telescopes and I've got hydrogen and I've got filters that allow you to see the activity on the edge of the sun. And that's my plan is to get one of these and take the point of place and share it out to everybody at once. And this was in 2006, in December 2006, so I ran the, the telescope at this on it and we had cues of tourists all day, so we showed them pictures of what they could see when they got to the telescope, and we showed them exactly that on the sun. Um, and once again, you can do it. Uh, that was simply holding the camera at, at the telescope and finding the right place, um, namely it doesn't need photos, that's the hardest bit, and, and sharing a picture, and it's not a NASA picture, but you know, it's Um, in January last year, we went to the Astro Camp um, at Tukhuli. It was run by Phoenix Astronomical Society and we used the Foxton or Palmerston North Astronomical Department of Foxton. Um, had a, um, had a, a brand new hydrogen alpha filter telescope. And that's what I saw. And once again, I was just like the camera there moved it around until I got the shot. So you can do it. Um, you can join those astronomical societies and they'll let you use their telescopes. Honestly, um, I saw that stuff coming off the sun and it, it's not flowing off like that, it takes three or four hours or maybe even a day for it to move away, but every time you go back and forth, because you get somebody else to it's moved a bit further, it's changed from the stuff on the science page. And so there's just two points before we close. Um, never look at the sun. The sun has massive radiation that's, that's not just bright white, it's invisible, it's infrared and ultraviolet, and my one of those all the way, my all three of them will bright you instantly. Like that. So we had go and saw measures of um, protecting people's eyes from the sun. 
and that means only use the approved viewing devices, uh, which means we're all with uh, an astronomy society who um, can comply with the rules. And then you will ask questions and um, thank you. Yeah, anybody else want to know anything? 